Hi, welcome to Go on a Run. And in this video, I want to show you how easy it is to use Golang to interact with a SQL server. Previously, we've seen how to use Golang to read data from a file and write data to a file. We have also seen how we can encode that data using JSON, XML, or even comma separated values. But those are not quite appropriate once you start scaling your application and you need some of the capabilities that a server, something like an SQL server gives you like multiple connection, indexing, fast lookup and all these other things, right? So, and especially relationship. Once you start having multiple entities, then you want to start talking about how things are related to each other. And that's what a database server gives you. Before we jump in, I want to cover a few things. The first thing is, well, let's imagine that we're working on my chat application and I have to get back to my chat application and the work that we wouldn't be doing on it. So let's say we're working on my chat application. We need to store information about channels, users, and the messages that users send to a channel. In this video, like I said, we're going to be talking about SQL. When it comes to SQL design, this is an ERD diagram, entity relationship diagram, and we have four entities here. So I have a message table, and this is going to have information about unique ID of that message, who sent the message, to which channel it was sent, and of course, the data for that message, maybe the time it was sent. But it's just an example. You can put in extend this table if you like, maybe remove some stuff, but I can't imagine you want to remove much more from this table. A membership table, and to understand the membership table, let's start with a user. So we'll have users who are going to register with a username, password, and potentially what their display name is, if it's different than their username or some other name. And maybe we want to keep track of data board. Again, feel free to add more fields to this table or remove. Once a user is on the system, we said that oh, they can create a channel. So we need the channel to have some reference to the user who created, and that's what this create a field is for that refers to the user who created. And that channel now we can say we just said that our channels can be private. Um, that you can have a description, but of course you need to have a name for that channel. Now membership is that table that needs to say which user is in which channel, and for that we need a separate table. And this is going to allow us to have a many to many relationship. And so we need a join in table and that's our membership table here, which has a reference to the user and the channel. And maybe when they join this channel and possibly the last message for that user that was sent on this channel. And now this brings us back to our message, which we can send to a channel and therefore the message need to have an ID to say which channel it belongs to. And of course, which user sent it. That is, one possible set of tables if we were to do choose an SQL that we can use for our MyChat application. Now, let me talk about the MyChat application. In the previous video, I showed you a design uh, with some UI for potentially MyChat web application that would allow users to talk to each other and join rooms and so on. And that is sort of the table I'm describing here. This wouldn't make any sense if you didn't watch the previous video. Now, after I did that, I realized something that I cannot actually work on this application. And the reason why is when I started the Go on the Run series, I said it was to just cover um, different topics in Go, and it really wouldn't focus on any sort of big org or arching goal. It's like show you little things, show you how to read stuff, uh, let's say read data from comma separate values and so on, how to like tips and tricks. And so I've had the question raised to do more full fledged application. Like one user asked to do an e-commerce application. And I said, well, uh, e-commerce application is very specific. Not everyone would be interested in e-commerce application. I imagine some of you will, but some of you might be interested maybe in this MyChat application. Maybe some of you might be interested in a game or something. So there are too many different things um, that people could be interested in. So it seems to make sense to, if I were to do like an e-commerce or a game or this MyChat application, to make that a separate series instead of pulling everybody along on to, to talk about a chat application when maybe that's not the interest of everyone. So that's one. So it would be wrong of me to say, no, I can't do an e-commerce application when someone asks me because I want to keep focus. And then for me to turn around and then go do a my chat application, which again is just 
very specific. That's why we can't really work on the my chat. And what I'll show you instead is just pieces in order to fill out the puzzle that will allow you to create different types of application, not just my chat application. Let's talk about how you would work with an SQL database from Golang. Before I get into that, however, if you go to the Golang website and look at the documentation for database slash SQL, it'll tell you that this package is sort of a generic interface for all SQL-like databases, but the actual implementation needs to be provided by the specific SQL driver. If you click on that link, you'll see that there are quite a number of drivers, SQL drivers. I used to use MySQL for most of my site projects, but um, I've returned to using Progress recently. Um, I said return because I started out using Progress and then migrated to MySQL, and so now I'm just coming back to what I started out with. And if you look at this asterisk, it says that the drivers mark with the asterisk are both included in and pass the compatibility test. I think more important is that they pass the compatibility test more so than whether it's included in something or the other. So if we click on this link for the progress driver implementation for S for Go, it'll take us to this site. This is at GitHub, but a much better place to look at this, I think, is to go to the GoDoc website and then type SQL or even progress. And you'll see that one of the first one that came up is the same one that we we're looking at just now. Notice that when you import a specific SQL driver, you only import it for the side effect. The side effect being that it registers itself so that it can be used when you give it the name, it knows which one to call. But you don't actually call that driver directly. You actually use the Golang generic driver, which in turn talks to the SQL driver. Now, for this to make sense, you basically need to go along documentation. You go to database, SQL, and then you go over to drivers. And then you click on SQL um, doc.txt, and it tells you the goals of this driver. If you want to use Progress SQL Server, go to the progresssql.org download page. There are a number of options. Now, if you're in Linux, you're set. You're going to have it installed by one of these packages, depending on which distribution you're on. Windows, I can assume that oh, it's sort of similar to how it's going to be done on Mac, but I do not know. So if you're on a Mac, however, there are a number of ways that you can install this, but one of them I would recommend. So let me zoom in a little bit here. And so you can do download this installer. Um, but if you scroll along a little bit, you'll see this progress app. And it's a very simple native Mac app that runs in your menu bar. I would suggest you go with this. So just download and run this. If you do that, you'll have this little icon here once you start up progress. You can see that how it says it's running on the port and you can open the command line, which we will not use, or you can quit. You can also go into preferences and set it to start every time your computer start. I don't have it set that way. You also see the directory where it stores data just in case you need to clear it out and start over. Okay. So I would recommend that. Now, remember I said we're not going to use the command line, but we still would like a graphical interface. So for that, I would suggest that you go install PG admin four. So just look it up on the web, PG admin four, search for it and install it. If you use the latest version, when you've started up, it open up a tab in your web browser. Regardless of which version of PG admin you're using, the result once it started will look something like this. Now remember how I have my progress server running already, which is this, it tells me it's running and it's listening on port 5432. And now I want to connect to it using this graphical interface. So I'll right click on server and I'll say, create a connection. The name of the server, let's call it local host to represent my computer. Connection detail. Well, the host is local. Port is already correct. Database is progress. I happen to know that once you run this progress application, it creates a database called progress and it creates the username for that database is the current user, whoever your username is. So in this case, my username is another so i know that oh, that's what it's going to use 
as the username and it does not have a password so i'll click save and then now i'll click connect and as you can see i was successfully connected to two that progress database that's running my computer you can see on the databases there's the progress database which is in that connection screen, string that we had remember i said it was progress and the user was just another and you can see here there's um, some users another is one and i had created some other user at some point but you can create additional users and then you have this schema that's public on the public schema you could create money schemas you have tables i don't have any tables yet on the, this particular schema so i can right click on it and say create table and now i can give it a table name and i can co create columns and so on so this is one way of gra graphically creating the table but i don't actually have to do it that way i can do it by bringing up sql here so now i'll create a table in this schema so So what this says is create table call user, give it a column call ID that's serial, which means increments automatically. It's a primary key. Then create another column called name. And then for username, we can choose whether to use email or something. But again, same thing about 64 characters should be enough, not null. And then password. Again, this is just an example. Feel free to add additional fields, choose which field should be of what type and whether it should be null or not. Okay, so now if I run this command, so I can execute this by hitting this, no say tell me to query run successfully. If I go back and I refresh and I look on the tables, I should see I have a new table called users, which I just created. Now we can do a test to see that uh, we can insert some data into our table. And so I can erase this and paste this and what it says is insert into my user table into the name column the user column and the password column these values so we'll put Verl as a name and we can even do Verl Adams whatever full name and email address if I'm going to use that as username and the password and we can do multiple records if we want but one is good enough and I run that and of course run successfully and if I want I can now search that table by doing select star from user table and now if i run this see come back with the result and notice my id column which i did not have to worry about when i did my insert is updated and if i insert another record let's insert another one so So run that and then let's again do a select see notice I have two records and of course um, the ID keep increasing so the question now is how can we do the same thing either create record or look it up from go so now let's switch our attention back to the progress example code and here it is so it says definitely import the database sql package from go and so you'll be using this package and then also get as a side effect the specific driver implementation so we know from the documentation that this is the package to use or one of the packages is at least to use this guy is one of the packages to use for progress if you're using MySQL, then simply just go follow the MySQL documentation, and that's here. And I suggest that you also look it up. And there is an example here, but you can look it up on the GoDoc page. So it's pretty much going to be the same. Okay. There's going to be a little caveat later, but for the most part, it's going to be the same. So let's just copy this and let's go to our editor. And here I have a very simple application right now. I'll close this one now and let's paste this in. So we want this import and get rid of that. And I can get rid of that. Okay. And so if you look at the import statement, let's take that out. 
And so if you look at the import statement, it says user name. So we know that oh, that's another in my case. Database name is Progress. And well, look at the host. Well, how do I know that there's a host property? Well, I think this will try to connect locally anyway, um, but just so I can show you, if you scroll down, it tells you what its connection string properties are. And so you have database, user, password, and host, for example, and SQL mode. Well, for the SQL mode, we want disable because I'm not running this in a secure manner at all. So this should be disable. And password is empty, so we're not going to specify that. Okay, and now when we say SQL, which is the generic driver that open, we're telling it which of the register drivers. And so this is how it knows which driver to use. And then here's our connection string. So now we'll just try and open the database and I'll get back a database and an error. So test check for the error. And if we're successfully open the database, then now we can query this database that we have let's query all the records in our database so we said row let's do query and select name comma so what about id name username and password well maybe we don't want the password okay um maybe only if we're looking up one specific user we might want the password so we can compare it with what they submit and we're doing this from users table and we don't have a condition a clause so we don't need that but this example from the documentation show you how you can parameterize your query okay so now that we have our select statement to read a number of records from our database now we need to iterate over this row and print it out so the way we can do this is to use rows that scan and this scans these for each row, it scans the value into a destination. So we have to specify where to store it. And for that, since we want to make changes, well, we have to pass a pointer. So we'll pass a pointer to a variable for ID, name, and username, respectively. So that's going to be we don't have these variable defined yet. So let's declare them. So in this case, I'm saying I want ID to be of type int and I want name and username to be of type string. And that seems appropriate. Um, so this is just a scan, but scan also returns an error. For now, I'll ignore that. We want to do this in a for loop. How do we know how when to stop scanning? Well, the row actually tell us, we actually call rows that next and it returns a Boolean value if there's a next value. So it's an iterator. And this is similar to what you'll see in the text scanner if you've used the text scanner. So this should get us what we want. Of course, we need to print out what we scan. And now we sh this should work. There's one other thing though. When you open a database, you should close it. Like anything else, when you acquire a resource, like a file or something like that, you should check this to make sure that you can close it. So we can close at the end of our program, but since we open it here and a number of possible ways we can exit our program, let's do a defer close. So that takes care of cleaning up our database connection. So let's run a code and see if this works. And there you go. We got back from our database the values that we stored in it. We have the ID and all the values that we inserted. The next thing is to see if we can insert. So now we know we can read data from our database. What about if we can insert data into our database? Let's do an insert before we query. 
So in that case, we have a few ex ways we can go. We can use this ex to run a query and get the SQL result back. And this would, if the database supports it, give us like the ID of, if you insert one record, give you the ID. For our example, we wouldn't worry about that. We'll simply use the same query function and see if we can use an insert with that. And so there we go. And I need a placeholder for these. So dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and dollar sign three. And then I need to pass the arguments. So those would be whatever username we want. So for example, uh, let's do this. Move this up here. We don't need uh, actually to specify the ID. And so username, let's do Okay, and now we need to pass those parameters here. So it's name, username, and password. Okay, so that should, if successful, and let's store this into a query result. So I think it's query result and an error. And so, Let's test and make sure that uh, we were successful. So, so let's just warn. And then we'll continue and try to query whatever is in the database. If we can't successfully insert a record, we'll just query what's there. And of course, if we insert, then when we query, we should get back everything that we inserted before plus our new record. And in terms of this, well, let's see what that is. Let's just print that out. See what it is. All right. Okay, we're getting a warning here. Oh, there we go, we need That's good. All right, so let's run this now. Oh, and there we go. So we can already see when we query, we got that last record that we inserted. And when we inserted, we got this crazy looking thing, whichever, whatever this means. Well, who knows, but we're not using it. So that's not important. But I was just curious what it is. So you can ignore this if you're going to write some code with this. And so you don't need to use that. And again, like I said, you can also use the exec function. So, oh, actually, sorry. Um, I think it's the exec function that had the query result. Um, so the other one that we use, just used, query, had rows. So we, we didn't still get back any rows. So anyway, let's try exec. And let's put back what we had, sorry, let's put back that and let's change this to exec. And it should work the exact same way. So let's call this And so hopefully if we run this, this should work. I'm saying it should work the exact same way. So let's run this. And yes, it did. We got back four results and notice how the query result tells us how many rows were affected. So that's one of the things you can use for doing things like that. Like if you run a delete command, for example, it can return to you how many rows were affected by your delete command. So as you can see, we can easily insert data into our database and query it from Golang. And like I said, it's pretty much the same for all the database drivers. If you read the documentation for, S for Progress, it tells you how there's a little caveat 
with when you do is the when you try to get back the ID of the row that you just inserted and there's a workaround for that. But other than that, I think just simply you read the documentation for the driver you're going to use to see if there are any sort of quirks or anything. But if you don't really need to do things like when you insert a record, know the ID of the record you just inserted, you might want to do that if you, like in our case, let's say we're working on a chat application, we insert a user, we might want that user ID so we can use it to create their private channel because that's one of the first things we have to do. So for, for reasons like that, you might want to get back their user ID. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, in the next video, I'll show you how to use go from like MongoDB to write to like a NoSQL database. And then finally, I'll use a graph database and we can fool around with that also. Um, thanks for your support. Bye.